I am Justin Gatlin. This is Ready, Set, Go. My man, what's up? Sad to be good. Good, good, good. good. But, but before we get started, I want to say, we have to say thank you to all the viewers, listeners. It means so much to me that you're partaking in my story, my journey, and um, even the haters who are tuning in, listening, <laughs> keep tuning in. It's much appreciated. <laughs> so what we'll, we'll are we getting on today, man? What's up? What's going on? We're getting on to that. 365, the last 365. Now, the last 365, you don't talk about it, but, I mean, you do talk about it, but we're going to talk about it. Here is something wonderful happened. Um, someone who I actually grown to care about. But in that last 365 of, of your situation, Chase happened. A lot of people might not know who Chase is, but explain who Chase is. Jace Gatlin is my 12-year-old son, man, um, born in 2010. So the last year of my, uh, my suspension, my ban, I was blessed with a, uh, a baby boy. Jace came along uh, unexpectedly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, what you wanna, what's up? What you want to know about it? Where you want to start at? Well, you know I'm a I'm a family man. Anybody that know Rod know I'm a family man. How tough was it to make that journey from Atlanta, not knowing if this the end would pan out, to leave your son and chase the goal of trying to be a better track athlete to provide him with a lifestyle that you that you can now. At that point, it was the toughest decision I ever made in my life. I mean, he was my first child, period. And um, I remember I got the call to go train in Orlando uh, with Brooks. And it was a great opportunity. Since I've been away from the sport for four years, I had to take that opportunity. You know? One second, everybody. Brooks Johnson, that's who he's talking about. Godfather of our tra USA track and field it was uh, mentored me as a coach and coached him as an athlete. So we just want to let everybody know who Brooks Johnson is. Brooks. <laughs> so um, I remember sitting down with uh, Jace's mom and uh, telling her I was thinking about making this move, going back into track and field. And I remember she said, she didn't want me to do it. She didn't want me to go. She didn't want me to leave. Not because, just because of Jace, but just the fact of the relationship that me and her had at that point in time. And I remember to this day, she said, I don't care who you are. You're Justin to me. You're not Justin Gatlin. You could drive a FedEx truck for all I care. And I told her, I was like, to love me is to love what I love. And I love track and field. And track and field has provided me with so many blessings. And I know that if I step back into the world of track and field and I really work hard at it, it's going to bless us more. So we was at odds for a while. And I remember having a lot of sleepless nights thinking about leaving my son. But it was a decision that I had to make to be able to provide and give him everything he needed in his life. So you say provide, but that has to be tough because four years, think about it, you wasn't gainfully employed, correct? No, for four years, I, I didn't make one dollar. Exactly. Didn't make one dollar. So your plan A and plan B, but your plan B had to be in plan A, succeed and succeed. Well, I had a mother Gatlin. <laughs> mother Gatlin was, was great with finances. So I was able to live off my own earnings at the age of 23 for four years and not earn a dollar for almost half a decade. And that's after paying the lawyers a million dollars. 
And that's after paying the lawyers a million dollars. That's great. Uh, tops off to, to Mother Gatlin. I got to get Mother Gatlin to look at my taxes. But uh, <laughs> uh, shout out to Mother Gatlin. But you moving to Orlando, what was that first year like? What was it for you getting the call from Brooks? Take us through that. You know, first of all, Brooks is a character. <laughs> Brooks, Brooks lives in 2022 20, uh, right now, but he is a person from the 1960s and 70s. Legit. 100%. 100%. Um, I can't even speak of all the accolades that he has accomplished in his career. So many. Uh, he's a marvelous coach and a great male figure to be around. And that's something I needed. Um, and regardless of how much money I saved, I came to him and I told him, I was like, look, man, you know, I don't have a contract right now. Um, I don't know how I'm going to be able to afford you on a monthly basis. And he said, don't worry about that. He said, I see how you were when you were competing with your parents. You respect your parents. And um, he said, that's all I need to know. He says, you're a man of quality. And I remember that, that said something to me because I don't like to have debt for, for one. And then <laughs> two, uh, he believed in me not because I was fast or because I won medals. He believed in me as a person. That he knew that if I had the opportunity, the tools, the training facility, the coach, that I could flourish. And I wasn't going to squander it. And I remember by the time I got paid, started getting money, I paid him in full right then, off the top. And he wasn't expecting that. Hand him a check right there. From that whole year of whatever I earned from track and field, he went straight to Brooks. And that's all that mattered to me. He took care of me. I had to take care of him. Yeah, Brooks, Brooks, is, Brooks is a solid guy, great educator, um, stand-up stand -up guy. Oh, <laughs> older guy, uh, if, you, if you don't have thick skin and you can see past... How he says what he says? Oh, you, say, you gotta say it like how he says it though. <laughs> Look here, motherfucker. <laughs> if you don't get around this track, <laughs> you, that's how you know what I'm saying. Yeah, but what he's saying is a hundred percent right when he teaches you about track and field and what it is. And he does have a passion. He has a great memory. He remembers every Olympics and World Championship he went to since he started going. Only missed one that I think one that USA was. They boycotted. Yeah, yeah. That's the only one he did. That's the only one to. that he missed. <laughs> That's the only one. He, I, I remember meeting him for the first time. I, I met him at his office. His office is Seasons 52. It is. If he ever, if you ever meet Brooks and he says meet him at his office, he means season 52. 100%. If he likes you, he take you to lunch. If he doesn't like you, you taking him to lunch. Yep. You're going to pay the check. You're going to pay the check. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just remember him throughout my training uh, cycle. And uh, going into nationals in, what was that, 2010, right? Getting ready for the qualify for Daegu, uh, the world championships. Um, he, well, that's like 2011, right? Yeah, 2011. He, um, <laughs> yeah, summer 2011. I remember running the 100 meter finals and getting edged out by Walter Dix. I was in lane seven. Walter Dix was like in lane three or four. And um, the first thing, and I made the team, right? This is my first championship that I made since I came back from my suspension, right? No one thought I could. I did. First thing that Brooks says to me is, look here, motherfucker. <laughs> I trained you for 100 meters. You went out there and ran 99 meters. <laughs> and you got beat. At the last meter, I need my damn meter. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, he was such a hard ass. I loved it though. You know, I love the fact that he was so passionate about what he did. 
And it made me want to work harder for him. So, Brooks, I appreciate it. Thank you, man. <laughs> Brooks, Brooks is, Brooks is definitely that guy. Uh, <laughs> tell y'all, I bet Brooks, bet Brooks, I went out to Disney one day. Um, had to been like at 20, when I was done running track at 20, 2014. And I saw he was out there with his kids. Well, he was out there with his, his oldest son. And I shook his hand. I went out there because of Joe. We, we both have a mutual friend, Joe uh, Brown. Uh, and I went out there and Brooks shook my hand. He was like, oh, you're Rodney who was training over there with Dennis. I was like, yes, sir. I was like, oh, you're out there with your grandkids. And he was like, F you, mother effer. It's my son. <laughs> 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 and, and, and that was crazy. That was the crazy story about Brooks. But no, no, mind you, people at home, we gotta give a little, a little background. Brooks is how old Brooks now? Brooks, Brooks like gotta be about eighty nine. Eighty nine years old. Uh, <laughs> around that time, he was probably like seventy seven, maybe something yeah. like that. All, right. <laughs> All gray hair, gray eyes, African American, and uh, can cuss like. The best sailor you've ever met in your life. Yes. But still applies so much knowledge and wisdom with everything that he says. It's an art form. And perspective. Definitely. He puts everything yeah. in perspective. He taught me how to, how to just not alone vet athletes, but to vet people. Because he asks weird questions to where you don't understand why. He asks if your parents are together, did you finish college? He asks what kind of grades you got in school, but he asks all of this to find out the characteristics of who you are, mm -hmm. person. Do you yeah. show up on time? Do you pay on time? And that tells him who you are if he want to be around you or not. Shout out to Brooks. There's, uh, I know we talking about it, but shout out to Brooks. We definitely he's a part of both of our lives. So shout out to Brooks. Um, getting back to that first, first when you made that team. What was that like when you? So now we've moved on from Fatlin. <laughs> we, we moved on from Fatlin. I lost a little bit of weight. Uh, I still was overweight. Uh, I still was like 200, high 90s. Now, mind you, when I won my Olympic gold in 2004, I was 183 pounds. So that's 10 plus pounds, right? Mm -hmm. so that's a lot when you sprint it. Yeah, yeah. A lot, a lot. Um, and that's not good because that causes injury, you fatigue quicker, all that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> but Brooks' philosophy was always so left field. Like he'd be like, look, you on the rainbow diet, okay? You eat anything under the rainbow because you work out every day. You don't, it doesn't even matter how, what you eat. <laughs> he shouldn't have told someone like me that. <laughs> Because that means that anything that's under the rainbow, that means if it's yellow, I'm eating them yellow McDonald's fries. <laughs> if it's red, I'm going to that windy sign. Red. <laughs> Man, that's you. So at the, after you make the team, travel to Daegu. This is your first championship back. But there's a, a giant at this time who's now fulfilled our sport. But wait, let me take it back. 2008, did you watch the Olympics? I did. I watched the Olympics. While I was away from the sport, I still, I'm a fan of the sport, man. I, I couldn't help but watch the sport. So that means you saw the 969. Just, and everybody who, who runs track and field know that the 969 wasn't a true 969. It was faster. It was how it was performed. What was the thoughts going through your head when you saw a young Bolt? Because he was Usain before that. And at that night, Bolt emerged. <laughs> what was going through your head? It was crazy because uh, I raised Bolt in, t in 05. Like, he was still young. He was probably like 19. I raised him in the 200 the World Championships in Helsinki. So I I've encountered Bolt before. Um, but the arrival of Bolt in 08, I don't think anybody saw it coming. I didn't see it coming at all. Um, 
and the way he won with the huge celebration with like 20 <laughs> meters to go, um, it blew my mind. But I think it blew my mind in a way that was different from where it blew other people's minds in the sport. It made me want to race him. I love to compete. I love to match myself against people who I think are better than me at some points. And I want to see how I can be better. So seeing that, as I sat at the bar and watched it, I think I was with the Barber Twins at the time. We was all hanging out in Georgia, and I watched it, and I was like, wow, that's, that's crazy. And I remember hearing the buzz that people were just so, after he did that, people were just scared to race him. Like, he just went God mode. Like, there was a lot of athletes who, who left sprinting and went to other events because <laughs> they just didn't want to compete against him no more, you know, or compete against that. So they feel like he broke the event. But from that moment I saw that, that gave me more hunger. I was like, this is what I want to line up against. And that was one of my goals. I was like, I want to get to a point where I'm back on the stage and I'm shoulder to shoulder with that guy. And we're about to go into a race. Which takes us back to the end of 2011. Now you made the team. First two days of Daegu, it's the 100 meters. First day is the heats. Second day is semis and finals, correct? Yeah. So you get out of the heats. Explain that next day to us. What's going through your mind and how did you prep for it and what's going on? Well, I love running at championships. I'm a gamer. I'm a championship caliber runner. I love it. I love the rounds. I love the, the endurance part of it. The preparation, I love the pressure of it. I didn't make the finals because a couple, maybe like three, two weeks before, before we even came over to Daegu for the championship, I got into a cryo chamber. And at that point in time, no one ever gave, it was hot on the scene. No one ever gave us instructions of what you can and can't do to go into a cryo chamber. So me and a couple of other athletes who were training that day, it was a hot summer day, sweaty, got into a cryo chamber. And the next thing I know, I get out the cryo chamber and I got icicles on my, my track shorts and I got blisters on my ankles from where my socks were wet and sweaty. And when I peeled my socks off, my skin came off my ankles and my Achilles. And they, became, they began to blister. So I didn't know what to do. I made the team already. I wasn't going to opt out. It's my first championship back. What, what, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we went to Daegu. And every day I woke up, I had to go to the medical tent. And there was a guy there who had to manually pop every blister on my ankle and my Achilles with a safety pin and all the little pus and everything gushes out. I couldn't walk around and I couldn't put regular shoes on because it would aggravate my blisters. So I had to walk around with flip flops on all day, every day to help hopefully the blisters would dry out before I get into competition mode. That didn't happen. So by the time I get to competition mode, first round, we try to figure out how can I run with and not feel pain while I'm running. So we came up with the idea of using uh, athletic tape. So we wrapped athletic tape around my blisters <laughs> <laughs> because if we put gauze, the gauze was too big and it wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't be able to fit into my spikes. Mm. You so had to use something skin tight. Exactly. So I had to use something that was skin tight. But the problem was that every time I ripped off the athletic tape, it would re-rip re my skin every time. So I wake up every, every morning after that, put powder to dry out the, uh, the open wounds and then bust all the other blisters. 
And then I got to a point where I went into the semis and I couldn't bear the pain, man. Like, I, I couldn't get to the next round. Was there a... I probably was confident in saying that, okay, I won 100%, so I probably could go next year. This won't happen. But not making the finals that year, that probably will be the first time you being in a huge championship not making the finals. Did that affect your thought process on leaving your son saying, oh, I failed or keep pressing or it'll change? Because at this point, you still don't have a contract. Well, I think that thought never really crossed my mind to a point where it was pressure because I was injured. I was, I was legitimately injured, you know? Um, I was more worried that I was going to have prolonged or permanent damage to my Achilles. Um, fortunately, that didn't happen. It, it made me sad because I wanted to go in that championship and I wanted to get on that podium for Jace. That was my driving force to be able to bring home a medal for him, make him happy, you know? Um, even with the pain that I went through, I still ran on the relay trying to earn a medal. And you know how that go. With that. <laughs> With that uh, Team USA relay <laughs> curse that we have. It's not a curse, I think, because y'all keep calling it a curse. It's a stagnant as a curse. Man. I'm being sarcastic. I know it's not a curse. <laughs> but it's some funny things that be happening, though, man. <laughs> it do. It was, especially that year, man. It was weird. It was so <laughs> weird, Doug. I mean, especially with Darvis running into one of the other athletes and him flipping and breaking his collarbone. That's crazy. You yeah. can't tell me that don't sound no, curse-like. It, it, that it, sounds it. curse-like. <laughs> it's, it's, it's How many crazy. track and field athletes you know that break that collarbone? I ne we never seen that in a sport unless you play football. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so I mean that that's where that's where I was. I was just I was at a point where I was upset that I wasn't able to win and and keep on that 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 winning path of winning a medal. But I was happy that I was running again. I was competing at the highest level I could compete at. I felt that like I was at home. Take us into to the next. Even though you love and you had respect for Brooks, you leave him that fall. I did. Um, I had to leave because I had no training partners. And I, when you are, for me at least, practicing and competing at that high level, you need training partners. Iron sharpens iron. You know, I need to know, I need to gauge myself against other, other athletes to see where I'm at, you know, especially if I'm having a good day or a bad day. How good is my good day? How bad is my bad day? You know? Um, and we tried. Brooks went out looking for other athletes. We just couldn't, at that point in time, find the athletes that were able to come and practice with us. I mean, he had three great hurdlers, David, Dwight, Joel. Um, I would do starting block days with them, but I mean, he's, how many starts could I really do? They're going over hurdles. I'm already by the tenth by tenth meter. I'm already passing them, you know. So I have nobody to really train with, and um, it was the hardest one. It was a very difficult decision for me to leave him. I remember I had to go to his house, and um, sit in his office, his real office. <laughs> Yes, in, in and, his uh, house. In his house. In his house. <laughs> and um, tell him that I won't be able to train with him anymore, you know, because we didn't have the, the necessary things that's going to make me a better athlete. Funny thing you say that. Me and Brooks talked about that before. He speaks very highly of you, and he, uh, he understood. Um, he always say, I have nothing bad to say about that young man. That man paid me my full check. <laughs> in full so I have nothing bad to say about that boy and he, he always states that so it, shoot there was no bad blood he still speaks highly of you I, I call him once a week so I not still talk to him, him. I, I go, <laughs> I've been to the office with him a couple of times uh, it, it was just that day like I cared about and I do care about Brooks so much I couldn't even look him in his eye when I told him that I couldn't I wasn't going to be able to train with him anymore 
it hurt me so bad because when you come from nothing, and what I mean coming from nothing, like at that point in time, you know, I was training here and there, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a solid, consistent training regimen. Mm-hmm. And being with Brooks, it gave me a step up. I got to a championship. I almost damn near won a nationals again. And I felt like, in a way, I abandoned him, you know? So it hurt me for a long time. It hurt. Now that you had a taste of success again, even though it wasn't the success you wanted, what were the fans like? What was the buzz you talked about after going through your suspension, how people may hurt you? Did you have fans again? Was it mixed fans or was it still bad? It was weird. Um, you had very few people who were happy to see me back. Then you had people you could tell in the way they looked at me, they didn't care for me to be back. And you just had some people who act like I was a ghost. Like, I, like and I walked in a room, they looked like, like, oh, he here? Like, that's how they looked. So it was weird. I, I couldn't, I really couldn't grasp a real feeling if I was hated or loved or it was just indifferent. It was just like so many different feelings. Um, so I just had to focus on me. You know, I had to focus on what I was there to do. You know, so. But some places I go, I'll get love. Some, a lot of other places I go, there was not a lot of love there for me. <laughs> I, was, I was blackballed. I was legitimately blackballed from all Diamond Leagues. Diamond Leagues came around while I was suspended. So when I came back into the sport, the Diamond Leagues existed. And uh, immediately, the meet from was like, oh, hell no. Nah. He not coming up in here. So I found myself running at little hole-in-the-wall meets around the world. And I was earning, I wasn't earning, I was, the money I was making from these small meets wouldn't even get me a flight home, you know? But I had to climb that ladder again. And I was okay with that because once again, it's a blueprint, it's a path. I know what it feels like to be up here at the top. And I, I'm here now. Now I just got to work my way back up to where I, I know why I should be at. So no matter what happened in the years, coming back up to the top, in your head, you knew I would all, I'm going to get here ultimately. My agent gave me the best advice. Ronaldo Nehemiah, who has been my agent since 2004, basically my whole career, he, he said, don't worry about that. It doesn't matter if you loved or hate, hate it. Um, it's all about results. And if you run fast times and these little hole in the wall meets, you're going to get attention. And if you start getting attention and running fast times, I can make sure you're getting these meets. And damn sure he did. He, <laughs> he made that happen. Um, there was one meat promoter. The meat promoter over Brussels back then. He was not the most likable person that a lot of people would say. So he, he was the guy that I didn't think was going to give me my first shot of being back in a, at the top level, meaning being unblackballed and being in a Diamond League meet. He gave me that opportunity, that first shot. I thank him for it because without him, I don't think that I don't think I probably would have ever had the opportunity because even till the day I retired, there was a lot of meets that I still could not go to. And a lot of people don't even realize that. There's a lot of meets that still would not take me. So I had to start figuring out how to kind of recraft and restructure what my success looked like. Takes us back to Lee Brooks. 
Who do you go to? I went across town. I stayed in Orlando and I went over to Dennis Mitchell. Dennis Mitchell. Dennis Allen Aloysius Mitchell. <laughs> Boy, he gonna get you for that. He gonna, <laughs> he gonna bring get it, you baby. That. Uh, shoot, that's, that's how we met. Uh, yeah. I trained with Dennis also um, as a Bahamian athlete. Uh, I remember fall 2011, we met. You stepped up and my name is Justin Gallen. Like, bro, everybody know who you are. <laughs> everybody know who you are. We training, what we doing? We five two fives, what we doing? So uh shout out to Dennis, man. Dennis, uh, he took he he definitely took me from a mediocre runner. I made some teams for the Bahamas, uh, training with Dennis. But I also uh got a credit most of my coaching career to Dennis. That's how I learned how to coach and systematically learned how to put things together uh, because uh, I did my thesis on Dennis Mitchell graduating from college for, uh, yeah, so. I didn't know that. Yeah. I, wow. I interned at the NTC at that point. Dennis was over there. Uh, he was the track, he was the head of their track and field coordination. I wasn't an athlete then. Um, just uh, I, I was doing my last year college and it was so interesting to watch him coach athletes. The athletes he had at the time wasn't like world class, but he, he was so passionate about the way he looked at track and field, what he did. And, and if anybody know Dennis Mitchell, you sit in the room and you listen to him speak, he could be so polarizing and so inspiring. And hearing him speak that way, I was like, I want to run for my country. And I, I begged him. I remember begging him to, to train with him, but he was like, no. <laughs> I, probably because I was too slow. I think coming out of college, I was running like 10 5 or something like that. But he was like, uh, no. But one day he said, you got to do repeat hundreds. And if you finish, I'll let you train with me. But it was like 40. 40 what? Repeat hundreds. <laughs> you had 40 repeat hundreds? Yes, and I did them. 40. I, they didn't look what? like quality. What was the rest between? The, the same 10, 15 10 seconds. seconds. <laughs> yeah, he did. No, you did. The child abuse. Child abuse. Oh, child my. Abuse. And, and Dennis probably will say that never so, happened. So but I remember. What were you running the hundreds in? They, like, they had to be like maybe 25 seconds. But they started out, you know, I wanted to try to impress him because, you know, I knew who he was as a track and field athlete. It was my first encounter with him. Uh, so... I, I probably ran the first one in like 13 seconds, which was wrong. Ooh, wrong. Boy. Don't you're trying do to that. kill yourself. Don't so, do so, so people tell people at home to understand exactly <laughs> what this workout is, if is hell, because you're running hundred meters, right? At a certain pace. He just did it in 13 seconds. His rest before he has to start his next hundred is, is 10, 10 seconds. seconds. He runs back. 10 seconds rest again, runs back. 10, 10 seconds, seconds rest again, runs back. 10 seconds rest again. So you're constantly running with little to no rest. I, I think it was more so for Dennis to like break me. So I just be like, I don't, I don't want to train with you because I feel like you don't want to train with me. And it possibly might not have been 40 because how I remember it, he would just keep on saying, ready, go, ready, go. So in his head, after he realized it wouldn't break, I think, my last one, I had to been running maybe 40 seconds. Like, I'm, I'm power walking oh, at you, this point. You were drunk. I'm like, you yeah, I'm, I'm drunk. And he's like, this kid's not going to give up. So he's you like. You to me because always on that third rep, not even third step, <laughs> the third rep, I always be dry heaving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I ended up training with him. And then that's how I met you when you came in 11. And um, I remember in my head, I was like, man. This dude just ran nine last year. I hadn't ran. Uh, I didn't care what you ran, but I said, boy, in training, well, I'm going to give it to this. And any, every rep and anything we do. And I remember our staff sessions used to be real, real fun. You know what I mean? It was me, you, Trandy Martina from the Netherlands. Shout yeah, out. Yeah. Uh, Rudy Monroe's from Haiti. Shout Rudy. out. Rudy. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, and and a couple other people, if I miss your name, please don't lay it to my to my 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 heart, lay it to my head, forget them. But 
I remember we used to go out there and we would be talking the most shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, but yeah, but that's how we met. So you you meet Dennis. Well, you not not meet him, but as your coach. So we actually didn't meet for the first time in person. We met through Facebook. I write him a message <laughs> and it literally took him a month to read the message. And he writes back. He didn't say like, hey, my bad man, or anything. He's like, yo, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> then it took me like three weeks to reply back to him. So then we got to a point where he was like, look, let's just meet in person. We met at Bahama Breeze. Bahama we had Breeze. wings and beer. Yeah, that's, 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 that's Dennis' <laughs> choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he said, look, man. Wait, need- was it the habanero wings? Of course, it was a yeah, habanero yeah, wings. Yeah. Going yeah. Habanero yeah. wings. <laughs> habanero wings and a tall glass of beer. And uh, he's like, look, man, I just need a horse in my, I need another horse in my stable. And I was like, well, I'm a horse that needs a stable. He's like, well, it sounds like we, uh, we on the same page. And pretty much that's how, the, that's really how the business part of the conversation went. And uh, he told me where we practice at and everything, logistics. He was like, all right, cool. Shook hands. I paid for the lunch and came to practice. I remember, I remember that first day. Dennis, he prepped the group, you know, uh, the whole group uh, before you came. He asked us about it and everything. Um, and everybody was cool. I mean, nobody had. And we always appreciated Dennis for that. He would sit down and be like, hey, you know, we have a new one coming. Uh, when we heard it was you, he was like, it was like, oh, the ghost. <laughs> the, <laughs> the ghost, ghost of right? Christmas <laughs> past is coming. <laughs> yeah. Because we, we knew the emergence. And just knowing Dennis as a coach, we, I knew that you would be successful. Um, but then because uh, developing an athlete like me down to where I was, where I was uh, 10 one, 10 two, I was like, by the time he gets somebody who's already running nine, and you and Jermani, I knew you would, y'all would be successful. Um, but uh, take us through that fall, because Dennis' fall is kind of hell. <laughs> take us through that. Uh. What was your goals at that point? Did you have a hit list? Were you like Rocky Balboa with a picture on the mirror? Or did you just was like, I just want to win? Uh, I had a hit list. I had a hit list with every, everyone's name on it, except my training partner. I, y'all wasn't on my hit list. So, but it was everybody under the sun that ran the 100 meters as a male. So I made a whole list and I didn't like, I didn't cheat myself. I didn't like copy and paste it. I literally wrote everyone's name out on a dry erase board. So when you beat one of these people, did you check, did you check it off? Like check next. Exactly. So, and you know, I had to like travel. So, you know, we'll fly somewhere and I'll look before we leave and be like, all right, who I got to race. I got to race these three guys. Boom. So I go over there with the intent of my hit list. So in my mind, I'm thinking like a hitman. Like, why I'm thinking like a hitman is because at that point in time, I still didn't have no contract. Mm. So I had to prove, I had to prove not only to myself that I was worthy, but I had to prove to other potential sponsors, I didn't beat this guy, this guy, and this guy. Then I would go down the list. Then I'll start marking off everyone's name. Shoot, and that, and that year. I remember correctly, you ended up being world champion in the indoor. I did. How, uh, did. how did that come about? Did you plan to run the indoor? Because in my head, I remember that training that year. Dennis didn't want any of us running indoor. Dennis, <laughs> Dennis never wants any of his runners running indoor. I think I was legitimately, at that point in time, one of the only people that ran indoor for him. Um, Let's take it back. 2003 was the first time I ever ran professionally indoor. Mm. I won the championship, world championships in 2003. Never ran indoor since. Now we're in 2012. And I'm begging this guy. I was like, let me run indoor. I don't even know why. I said that I want to work on my start. Because he told me, he said, you're coming back into a world that's different from when you left. 
everyone's faster and stronger. And the only way you're going to be able to compete with them is that you have to get out into that race. You can't have that slow start or that normal start you used to have and think that you can run these guys down. Not going to happen. So I was like, all right, I need to work on my start. The best, way, some best place to work on my start is indoors. I begged him for like three weeks. Please, please, please let me work on my start. Let me work on my start. He's like, all right, cool. If we're going to run indoors, and I was just thinking just run indoors. Like just run a couple of races and I'm done, right? He's like, nah, if you're going to run indoors, we're going to run and we're going to go to world championship and you're going to win. I was like, what? Hold on. <laughs> so we started working on our start. And literally like days, it would be days after we finished training and I'll stay a whole nother hour. And he just work on my start. He'd be like, nope, nope, do it again. Nope, do it again. Nope, do it again. Until so I started getting it. And then I started doing it and doing it and doing it, right? And um, he got me some spikes. I, I didn't, at that point in time, I didn't have any new spikes. All the spikes I had were almost, they're almost, uh, they're almost a decade old. I was running in spikes I ran in 2004. So, they were starting to get dry rot and everything. So he got me some, uh, he pulled some strings and got me some Adidas spikes. And at that point in time, you know, we weren't with Adidas and we weren't against Adidas, but it was just Adidas, you know? And um, he didn't want the other people on the other side of the track to see where we were in Adidas spikes. <laughs> I remember this. So he, <laughs> I remember that. So he, he spray paint the spikes, <laughs> but, He's known as the green machine, right? It's a neon green. So mm -hmm. he'd spray paint these spikes neon green. Now, have you ever seen someone spray paint something? It's, it's supposed to stay spray painted, right? But on things that are solid, not things that are flexible. So every time I ran, it just, the paint would just crackle off. Crackle, crackle, crackle. So I was like, man, fuck it, whatever. We just gonna run in these damn Adidas. And we went out there, I ran, I won a world championship in Adidas spikes, indoors. Oh. What, does, what does that do for your confidence at this point? Because now you went in, wanted to work on your start. Now we got our first taste of world championships again. Do we have new fans at this point? Do we have new haters at this point? What's the media saying? What's going through your head? Man, I was on cloud nine. I, I, I have a, a gold medal in my hand again. I'm on top of a podium again. It's indoors. But I'm a winner. I'm a winner. I, and I'm beating people who are legitimately known to be fast starters. I'm beating them at what they're good at. Um, it didn't change much, though, to be honest. As I went into the outdoor season, I still was blackballed. I still couldn't run certain races. Uh, I still was getting a lot of negativity, especially in the media. My press conferences as I went to, as I started getting into bigger meets, oh man, um, press conferences were hell. It was straight, pure hell. Cause I felt like every time I was going into a boxing match, I dreaded going to press conferences. They, I could know firsthand, they kind of, knowing you personally, it kind of changed my whole view of you because when you watch TV or you look in the press, it kind of shapes your narrative of who you think someone is. Tell you meet them in person. Meeting you in person, spending time with you, alone and not alone, I realized what the press painted about you or who you were or who you could be. I was like, I mean... I can't swear for anybody, but I was like, ain't no way. It can't be this guy is, this guy is just a generally a good guy. I, I couldn't really find too much. And I'm, I usually get myself as a good judge of character. So I just seen so much more than what I seen that was written by the press. So at that point, you start to win again. Those yep. meets coming up. Now this is 2012. Because now it's indoors. This is 2012. 
Now, this is your first Olympics since the Olympics. Yeah. What was that like? Do you go from indoor with a new confidence? Do you go from indoor with, okay, all right, the goal is to make the team? Or, you know, because at, at, at this point, we still have the big juggernaut or the big elephant that's in the room, Usain Bolt. He's still dominating and everything else. He's already got the Olympics and the world championships beyond him. He's ranked number one in the world. But you still got to get past the U.S. champion, Tyson Gay. What's, what was that like? And at this point, he trains right on the other side of the track. Literally. He, <laughs> he trained at the same track on the other side of the track. With Coach Lance Brahman. Shout out to Coach Brahman. Um, I started gaining traction. Started getting a lot more people crossed off my list, like I said. So that confidence started building up again, you know? Um, my plan was to go to the Olympics and win. Win that motherfucker. <laughs> win it. Turn the whole world upside down. Win it. And I, I, went, I literally went in to the starting line of the finals like, I'm about to win this shit on all y'all. <laughs> Um, because you know, I think I, I saw Degu, right? And that was the first time Usain and only time he false started. So he didn't, he didn't win. So I'm thinking in my mind, oh, it must be the pressure or, you know, whatever. Like I said, I don't know Usain then, right? As the years went by, I, I kind of got an understanding who Usain was. Um, but going into the Olympics, the Olympic trials, against Tyson was a whole nother battle because he was, quote unquote, my predecessor when I left the sport. And now that's the guy I got to beat to get my throne back, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like you and Tyson are one of the, one of the great U.S. rivalries that's not talked about. Uh, and I think on the all-time list, I think you guys are behind each other. If I'm not correct, it's like 6'9". No, it's Safa Denyu. Yeah. Yeah, so, but you guys are behind it, but it, it's a rivalry. Mm -hmm. Even when he was in college, I think when you won world championships, he was behind you. I think he went to that world championship day. No, 05. 05. So I, I think, and I can't speak for him. <laughs> <laughs> But there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of different scenarios that built bad blood along the way, right? So in 05, he was rocking and rolling. Him and Wallace were running 19 seconds, like it was going out of style. And then they get to the championship in, in Helsinki, and I, and I win double gold. I beat all of them. I win the 100 meters, and I come back, and I win the 200 meters, and he gets fourth in a whole sweep. So we go one, two, three, and four. So he's the guy that's left out. So maybe he felt some type of way at that point. So then you fast forward, suspend it. He, he rises to the top, and then I come back. He probably like, this motherfucker here. Here he is. <laughs> I would be like that, right? Yeah. Um, but I remember talking to Dennis, and Dennis was like, look, we going in here to win. This, this is the Olympic trials. We coming to win this Olympic trials. He's like, that motherfucker right over there, across the track, that's the only motherfucker that's going to stop you from winning this Olympic trials. We got to work to beat him. And that's what we did. We started working on every aspect of our 100-meter race, how it's going to break down where his strike zones are, where he's good at, where he has uh, uh, faults at. And then we went in there and we ran our, I ran my race pattern to the T and came across that line. So. Did you win? I won. What time? 980. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I think it was, yeah, I think it was 980. Yeah. Nine, 980. Yeah. Shout out to Tyson, man. You know, hopefully we, we could get him on there and we talk about some of those stories. Uh, shout out to the, the Wallace too, man. 
Wallace, one of the greatest runners of all time. Um, but uh, after you win, now you made the team. Mm-hmm. First Olympic team. How does your teammates accept you now? Because now, when you were on your way back, nobody really worried. As long as you wasn't winning, it didn't matter. It was never really, other than the fact that whatever static I had, like with Tyson, no one ever to my face ever showed me bad blood. So most of the athletes either left me alone or they were cool with me. And that was, that was what it was. So after winning, I started gaining more respect. People started saying, all right, this motherfucker legit. All right, cool. You know what I mean? He really can run. He putting it down. He competed, you know? So I went into the Olympics. But I felt like USA on my back. True. Let's, 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 let's dial it back some. So in 2012, this is like possibly the hardest year in track and field to be a 100-meter runner because the Jamaicans, they, they like, they are, they running, they literally running the world. Like they, they, they doing what they do. And I think it's probably, at, the, at this point, Jamaica is where the USA was, where you could run 9-9, not make the team. No, make the team. They were, they were that good. They were that good. You yeah. could run 9-9 and be on the relay pool or at, at the crib. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that was a very hard time in track and field. So talk about the Jamaicans a little bit. Usain, obviously Blake. Safa. I mean, what Nesta you, Carter. What can you say? It, it literally was the renaissance of, of sprint, of Jamaican sprinting. Like, that's what, exactly what it was. I mean, it was like the stars aligned. Like, you had Usain at the top. You had Johan, who was the next to take the crown. You had Asafa, who was tried and true, veteran, um, still running crazy fast times. And um, you had Nestor Carter, who was up and coming as well. So Michael Freighter. And you had Michael <laughs> Freighter. So me had all these guys who were feeding off each other. And what I mean by that is like the success of one was a success for all of them. And they used that as inspiration to run faster. And iron sharpened iron. So you had these guys who were like, oh, you saying can do it? I can do it. And now you see Johan out here running nine eights. You know what I'm saying? And then he goes into nine sevens and so on and so on. So, but at the end of the day, none of that shit scared me at all, bro. Like, it's weird because it was like, <laughs> I still went in with the intent of, I'm about to win the motherfucking Olympics. In my mind, that's exactly how I felt. Like, no one could tell me that I was not going to win this <laughs> shit. <laughs> and um, I just remember, I remember it just, Watching them compete while we was at the Olympics, watching them practice on the other side of the track, Johan and Usain, right? And they're running these flying hundreds, boom, boom, boom. And by the time they get to the 50 meter mark, they kick up another, another gear. Like that, right? And I'm thinking like, what? You no, know, what, kind of, what kind of style is that? Get into finals, that's what kind of style it is. <laughs> <laughs> a winning style. <laughs> I mean, you watch the race, you see what happens. So, but I, I don't want to, yeah. So I watched them. And I remember being so hyped for the prelims. We go out there, I ran a good time in the prelims. I think I ran the fastest prelims ever in Olympic history at that point. And as I'm giving the interview after the race, still in the stadium, right? Uh, Ryan Bailey comes along and runs 988 in the first <laughs> round. As I'm talking, giving an interview, and it's like, I look back like, oh, well, yo, that, that's gone. So, <laughs> so that showed you that like everyone in 2012 was rocking and rolling. That Olympics was, I think that was probably like the fastest Olympics in history. Like yeah, it, yeah. everyone was rocking and rolling. I think Bolt ran 963. He broke the Olympic record in the again. Final, yeah. yeah. In the finals. In the prelims, me and Sharandi, 
we uh we come across the line one and two in our semis. Oh, yeah. Training partners. Training yeah, partners. We're both training partners, same uh, camp. We bumping chests afterwards, like, yeah, let's go. <sighs> to the finals, baby. Ain't nobody gonna stop us. You know? Um, that was like the easiest 982 I ever ran in my life. Boom, dry face for like 50 meters, came up, looked over, hawked down a sofa. It felt good, right? I was like, all right, one off, all right, who we got next? So you go into the finals, and it just was like amazing to be at that level again. It felt amazing. But weird because I'd never stood by somebody, stood next to somebody who was like 6'5 for one in a race. And when you compete against someone like Usain, he commands the attention. And I never, I've never competed against somebody who commands the attention like he did. Like he would control the level, octave levels in the stadium just by gestures. Like a, like a maestro. <sighs> like it was crazy. Um, it was damn near distracting. <laughs> but I can tell you that if you watch that race, I was so dialed in, so zoned. Gun goes off. I'm beating everybody. 50 meters, like, yeah, about to bring this shit home. <laughs> and that's when everything clicked for me when I was sitting there watching them at practice and they was running those hundreds and they'll kick another gear at 50. When I got to that 50 meter mark, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> Both of them went. <laughs> and it just took off, right? So I'm just like running and I'm like, all right, cool. I don't even know what place I'm in, but I know that I need to make sure I stay, keep Johan in the line of sight. Usain was gone. That was nine six. <laughs> Johan was still there. That was nine seven five. I came at nine seven nine. So, and I was like, for me, even though I didn't win, like I, I wanted myself to win so bad, it was a victory because I'm in 9-7 shape. After everything I've been through, away for four years, coming back, blackballed, I'm running a time that not many human beings have ran. And I'm already, I was already set back. So... It only gave me inspiration to keep going. Man, I'm so back in 9-7, you're on the podium. You're standing next to 6-5. 6-5. But you feel like you're at the top of the podium because now it's like a full combination. I'm back. Literally, you're back because it's the Olympic. They showed me love. Like, Johan, Usain, congratulations. Good job, man. Good job, you know? Even the stadium cheered and clapped for me. We're in London. Let's keep that, let's keep that point of reference. Yes. We are in London. 100%. I understand why you said in it. In 2012, we are in London. I win the bronze medal. The crowd cheers for me when they say my name. I felt like I was on top of the world. I am amongst the greats again. And that's how I felt. Yeah. That podium, so first, second, and third, synonymous with all time in human history, it's number one, number two, and number five fastest humans of all time on that podium at that time. It's just crazy. This is this is this is crazy. Um, keeping it in that year, what's birthdays and Christmas like now? Now. Yeah, no, no, now. Oh, now, oh, now. Like, or 2012. Yes, yes. yes. I know oh. birthdays and Christmas, like, we be down there together. Well, be down there together. Well, lovely. <laughs> for the fact, because now, I got to rewind a little bit. Before I went to the Olympics, I finally got a shoe sponsor. But here's a trick. They didn't make shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so I signed with a Chinese company. At that point in time, I still, like I said, I was still blackballed. A lot of people didn't want to touch me with a nine-foot pole, whatever. Nike, Adidas, the, lo the, the regulars, right? 
So I wasn't getting no love from the regular sponsors. So my agent, my agent thought outside the box. He's like, well, let's go look for companies that are looking for athletes and see what we can do. So we partnered with this company called XTEP, Chinese company, worth $10 billion. So they had a lot of money. They did well. Um, but their thing was they worked with strictly Chinese personas because I can't even say athletes at the point in time because they was working with movie stars and singers mainly. And they would, they would basically sponsor marathons. Mm-hmm. So they had a lot of running shoes and sneakers, but they had no track spikes. Mm-hmm. None. No track spikes. So they allowed me to have a contract where I had a carve out where I could wear other spikes. Mm-hmm. Then they came up with the idea as I started running faster. It was like, whoa, 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 whoa. We love you wearing the X-Tep gear, but we want to make sure you get in some shoes. So they thought the idea of making spikes. So they had a spike maker. So this guy came up with this crude way of making spikes. Like he found like a, a, the sole or the plate of a, a Adidas spike plate, right? The bottom. And then he crafted like the top. And then he used like some kind of cheap shoe glue to put it all together. So as time went on, you sweating in heat, like everything started becoming looser and falling apart. And uh, I remember at the Olympics, 2012, <laughs> I'm in the tent between the semis and the finals, and I'm super gluing the sole of my shoe back to my upper. And I remember Dennis walking by, I'm like, them motherfucking shoes gonna explode on you at 50 meters. <laughs> and he walks off. But I was loyal to them because they, they were loyal to me. You know what I mean? They stuck by me. So I wanted to ride with them. Shout out to X-Tip. If y'all looking for sponsors, y'all can throw some money this way. <laughs> uh, that's good, man. That's good. So now we, we back. You know, we, 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 we feel like things are starting to come around. Um, Birthdays are good. Now we could. Christmas was good. Send stuff back home to Jace. At this yeah. point, we know we made it, the right decision. We did. You know, at, at that point in time, uh, Jace came to Olympic trials. So it wasn't like he wasn't a part of my success. I made sure that Jace was there with me and understood of my absence and what I was doing to provide for him at what level. And I think he had the opportunity more than once to see me in my element and understand what his father is doing and why I'm doing it. I sacrificed being there with him so I can give him the world. And that's good that that you say that because I think a lot of athletes or just not even athletes, just people in general, don't understand that success comes with some level of sacrifice. You can't get one without the other. You wanted to provide your son and, and with a lifestyle that you believe he deserved. You went out and you trained your behind off and got back to the top to be able to do that because even in Atlanta, you had Nothing that's remember you were not gainfully employed for four years. So that means we have a lot of money going out, none coming in. So it's very scary uh, when you're spending money and not making any. That's, that's very scary. So I, I, I've, I've been there before, so I know how that feels. <laughs> so I know how that feels. But success comes with that type of sacrifice. Sacrifice paid off. Um, We're going to save a lot of this for the next episode. Going into 14 and shoot, I think the year of 
Superman Justin in 15. <laughs> you can't forget 13. Either. Yeah. 13 was a dog fight too. Yeah. So, For sure. Yeah, so. I just want to say, uh, Jace, I love you. And everything that I've done thus far has not only been to make you happy, but I hope that you're proud of me. I hope you're proud of the man I've become and had to become to make sure that you have everything you desire. Love you, man.